There's over 600 muscles in the human body. The good thing is, as you're studying to become a personal trainer, you don't need to know all of them. Not all of them will you be using in the gym every day. So in this video, we wanna simplify your life. I truly believe this is an extremely important part of what we do, but we wanna keep you focused on the right muscles as you're getting started. Not only the ones you need to know for your exam, but also the ones you're probably gonna use most as you're working with clients in the gym. So in this video, we're gonna break down a couple of the main sections that you need to spend the most time on as you're going through and studying. Before we continue on with the video, I wanna make sure you guys see the link in the description below. We've created a super detailed download for you guys to help you as you're studying and trying to memorize muscular anatomy. It even includes blank charts for you to practice and see how you're retaining the information. So make sure you guys click the link in the description below to get your hands on that guide. I wanna break it down for you guys just like we do for the students in our class, and we're gonna start out with below the knee. There's really only three muscles that I want you guys to pay attention to. Two of them, you guys know as your calf muscles, but we're gonna dive into specifically what they are. The first of those is gonna be your gastroc, right? This is the more superficial, kind of heart-shaped muscle that we see on the outside. Not only involved in plantar flexion or pushing us up during a calf raise, but also slightly involved in knee flexion as well. And that's what's gonna be what differentiates the gastroc versus the soleus, right? I wish I had better calves for you guys. But the soleus is gonna be that muscle you can kind of see almost sits underneath of, travels below, and sits right underneath of that gas rock. Now, this one does not cross over the knee. It's only gonna be involved in motion at the ankle, but those are the two primary calf muscles. And then on the opposite side, we know our body works in this agonist-antagonist relationship. And the one that you guys need to know, especially as you guys get into things like the overhead squat with the NASM assessments, a lot of this comes into play. Understanding overactivity in some of those calf muscles and underactivity in your anterior tibialis. Very common, right? How often are you just sitting here lifting your toe off the ground? Probably never. But that's what that muscle does. This anterior tibialis, it brings the shin and the toes together. Or even more specifically, as we're walking, it helps to slow down the descent of that foot. The next section is gonna be between the knees and the hips. And we're gonna keep it very simple because as we start to get into these areas of the hips and even the shoulders, we have a lot of muscles that attach. I mentioned at the beginning of this video, 600 muscles in the human body. We wanna stay focused on the most important ones. So as we're looking at what we call this anterior view, right, the front side of the leg, most of you guys are like, okay, cool, Joe's gonna talk about the quads. Again, that's the muscle group. You guys need to know specifically the individual muscles themselves. And the easy thing for you guys with the quads, the three of those start with vastus, right? We have vastus muscles. Those vastus muscles are just going to drive flexion at the knee. They don't cross over the hip, right? That's gonna be a differentiator. But as we think about the inside, right? Someone has nice quads, flexes their quads. You see this little teardrop on the inside. That's gonna be your vastus medialis. Medialis to the midline. You can't see it, but right in between that, right, right next to that medialis is gonna be your vastus intermedius, right? It actually sits underneath of another of our quad muscles. And then the last of our vastus is gonna be that vastus lateralis, right? Easy to remember with your anatomical terminology, vastus lateralis, vastus intermedius in between, and vastus medialis. And the fourth of your quad muscles is gonna be your rectus femoris. This one is unique in that not only does it work to extend the knee, but it also works to flex the hip, right? It's gonna attach as you touch that little bony portion of your hip, what we call your ASIS, all the way down into that knee. Unfortunately, you're not gonna see my hamstrings quite as well as you might see the quads, but our three primary hamstring muscles that you guys need to know and pay attention to, right, are gonna be what we call our semimembranosus, which is gonna be, easy way to remember, semimembranosus more towards the midline, right? As you look at the image that even popped up on the screen, this is gonna be one of those hamstring muscles that comes down and attaches inside of the knee. So you have your semimembranosus, then right inside that we have our semitendinosus, and then to the lateral portion, right, this one's gonna come out and attach to the lateral portion of our leg here to the outside of the knee, that one's gonna be our biceps femoris. Those are your three primary hamstring muscles that you guys need to know and pay attention to. It starts to get a little bit more complex as we move further up into the hips and all the muscles that attach to the pelvis area, but we're gonna break it down more so into muscles of what I say the hips and then also the core, because especially with NASM specifically, we have two core systems that I'm gonna refer to. But first off, when it comes to the other muscles we haven't talked about so far that attach to the hips, one area that's really important, again, 
comes back up inside some of your assessments is the adductor complex, right? We think about our AD ductors, those inner thigh muscles. They are a lot of individual muscles, right? If you've gone through anatomy classes, you've probably learned about, you know, adductor magnus, adductor longus. You don't need to know the individual adductor muscles, which is great for you guys, because for the most part, they all do similar things, right? Not only do they adduct and bring the legs together, but they provide a lot of stability in the frontal plane. So just understanding that the adductors attach to the inside of that femur and to the pelvis as well to help us provide stability. And on the opposite side of those AD ductors are gonna be our AB ductors, right? We have adductors, we have AB ductors, or what you guys probably all know as your glute muscles. And there's three primary glute muscles. We have our most external, right? Our nice round rump. Our, glute, our gluteus maximus, all right? That's gonna be the bigger mover. And that one is not only gonna be an AB ductor, right? We think about bringing that leg out, but also external rotation and extension at the hip, right? That's one reason why those glutes, especially the glute max, are involved in so many movements at the lower body. But underneath of that, especially as we look more to the side, controlling the frontal plane, you'll find our glute medius, which again, one that comes up a lot on your NASM assessments with the overhead squat, because that glute medius, although is an AB ductor, really what it does is it helps to control stability and frontal plane movement in relationship to the hips and the knees. And then right underneath that as well is gonna be your glute minimus. And the last area of the hips, right, as we're trying to complete some of these muscles that start to kind of transition a little bit into our core musculature is also the other hip flexors. And I say other hip flexors because we already mentioned one of them. One of our hip flexors is the rectus femoris, right, one of those quad muscles. But if we think a little bit deeper than that, some of you guys have probably heard of maybe your psoas or your iliacus. And together, oftentimes, they're called your iliopsoas is kind of a complex. And as you look at some of the anatomical images, especially the download that we've included for you guys, you'll see these muscles are really kind of hidden underneath quite a few others. And one of them attaches up to our actual pelvis, the other one actually to our lumbar spine. So they're kind of hard to get to, but they're very important ones because they can be a problem area for a lot of clients. Building off of our hips, we transition right into our core. And there's a lot of muscles that are non-traditional, or at least not what a lot of people think of as being core muscles that are talked about inside the NASM curriculum, which I think is extremely important. It starts to give us a better way as personal trainers to look at how we go about training core for most clients. And one thing that's really important for you guys, as you dive back in, I recommend you get back inside of the core training specific chapter because they do give you guys some good graphics to go along with what we're doing here on what muscles are involved in the local system and what muscles are involved in the global. And we've even talked about this in other videos inside of our subsystems and other things as well. That local core system, you wanna think about segmentally the muscles that are deeper, right? That deeper layer of the onion and these muscles are more about providing just stability to the spine. The muscles that we're gonna find in here, things like our pelvic floor, right? Also our diaphragm, our breathing muscles, right? Transverse abdominis, some of these muscles that sit in there deeper. So make sure that you do review inside the core chapters, those local core muscles specifically. And then that'll help you transition further into what most of us think of as our core musculature, some of the global muscles. This is gonna include the six pack, right? Our rectus abdominis our external and our internal obliques, even getting into other muscles like our lats, which many of us don't think of core muscles, but really serve an important role for transferring forces. As we look at, that's the primary difference between that local and the global core system. Local, stabilization of the spine, global, transfer of greater forces. As we transition up further away from what we consider to be our core, we start to transition into what I'm just gonna call muscles of the upper body or the shoulder complex, as most of these muscles will start to create attachment to either our shoulder blade or the actual glenohumeral joint in itself. And one thing that's really important as we move into the shoulders, because it's such a common area of restriction and even injury for so many people, is that these major ball and socket joints, right, this area of the shoulders and the hips, these are the primary movement junctions of the body. So we're gonna have a lot of smaller muscles that also attach. You guys know probably the rotator cuff of the shoulder, well, although we didn't go into detail in those muscles, we have the same thing in the hips. There's a lot of deeper, smaller muscles. These are a really great area for ongoing learning for you guys, but as you're here getting started right now, I wanna keep you guys focused on more of the prime movers and the bigger muscles. Because again, as you guys look at the images, even we've included on here, a lot of layers to what's happening in the upper body. Two primary muscles, you guys wanna make sure you really understand where they start and where they end, like really zoom in 
and see the muscle fiber arrangement because it'll have a big impact on how you understand them. One of those is the lats, right? We think about the lats as our pull-up and our rowing muscles, and they do that. Almost any motion at the shoulder joint, your lats are gonna be involved in, right? They're involved in extension at the shoulder, and every motion from sagittal out to our frontal, like everything in between. Because of the way our shoulder blades sit on the rib cage, whether we're doing pure extension in the shoulder, or we're doing some sort of abduction and everything in there, the lats are gonna be engaged and involved. And then they also tend to be, as we go back to the overhead squat, what might limit us from certain positions. Now a key piece of this is knowing where they start. Right, they originate down in this, what we call the thoracolumbar fascia. As you guys look at your anatomy images, that's gonna be that white connective tissue. This is really important, right? Because that means not only do the lats help drive motions at the shoulder, but it also means the lats can impact lumbar and hip stability, right? I may go into one position here and it pulls there. And also just creating isometric tension in those lats can help create more stability in the torso. Just why one of the many reasons why there's such an important muscle for you guys to understand. And on the opposite side of the body, in addition to our lats, we've got a lot of other muscles we're not gonna go through that might be on the deeper, further underneath of those major muscles, would also be the pecs. Right, we have pec minor that sits deeper underneath, attaches more to our upper rib cage, but our pectoralis major, really interesting here as we look at our lats and our pecs, is where they insert into the arm, right? The lats come in, they insert into the medial border, which is one of the reasons they're actually also involved in this internal rotation. Well, the pecs, right, we train different angles, right? We train, we've got these lower fibers, these mid fibers, and these upper fibers that come in, and then it kind of twists, right? Almost twists as it comes into that shoulder. So just like the lats are involved in all these angles, so is the chest, right? We think about push-ups, but almost any motion from flexion and everything else in between as we get into these horizontal ABA deduction motions, the pecs might play a role and can also be a limiter for certain positions. So just spend a lot of time making sure you understand lats and pecs as those are some of your big prime movers of the upper body. And as you look at some of your anatomical images, you'll see there's not really a clear definition between where the pecs start and where the deltoids begin, right? Or the pecs end and they all kind of come together. It kind of starts to look like the same muscle fibers, which makes sense because our body wants to be able to transition from different positions and use those muscles. And oftentimes they're working together, right? We have our deltoids, which we know is like anterior, medial, and posterior, but it's one muscle. So based on the different angles that we're in, those shoulders end up taking a lot of stress. And those are three of the primary muscles you're gonna to wanna to pay attention to. I find for most people at this stage, understanding of triceps and biceps is a little bit simpler, but also pay attention to the images there as well. Many people don't know that our biceps brachii not only has multiple heads, but also don't know that it crosses over the shoulder. And the more clients you work with, the more bicep tendonitis that you'll run into. So spend some additional time taking a look at some of the images that are involved there. There is so much going on when it comes to muscular anatomy. And inside this video, we just wanted to cover a couple of the main areas that you need to pay attention to and try to give you some sections because that's what's gonna help you guys as you're going through and learning this stuff, break it up into some different regions, right? Start to think about what muscles are involved, what exercises are involved with the muscles in that area, and it's gonna help you apply it a lot more in the gym. And hopefully, if you guys haven't already, you guys get your hands on our free download that we put together for you guys, because after working with hundreds of students over the last 10 years going through and becoming personal trainers, I know it's tough to memorize some of these muscles. So hopefully this resource serves you guys, and I'll see you guys in our next video.